Well, this is actually my first um, Zoom uh, lecture. At, at my school, we're recording in advance and then uploading, which was what I was planning on doing tonight, but I ran out of time. So we're live tonight. Um, and the other thing that I had been doing for the last two weeks is, you know, I've been very upset, I have to say, by, by watching the events in America. And I tried to connect my talk to those events, um, but they're not, it's not ready yet for, for, for prime time. So I've pared it down to its um, original roots. And I'm just going to uh, give a talk that's very much focused on Korea. Um, and Korean music as well. <clears throat> so in 1933, the Spanish poet Federico Garcia Lorca gave a lecture in Buenos Aires titled Theory and Play of the Duende. In his lecture, the poet described a performance by the famous cante singer La Niña de los Pienes. He said, she got up like a mad woman, trembling like a medieval monk, mourner and drank in one gulp a huge glass of fiery spirits and began to sing with a scorched throat, without voice, breath, color, but with duende. She managed to tear down the scaffolding of the song, but allow through a furious burning duende, friend to those winds heavy with sand that make listeners tear at their clothes. Lorca said of the artist in general, Every step that he climbs in the tower of his perfection is at the expense of the struggle that he undergoes with his duende, not with an angel, as is often said, nor with his muse. La Niña de los Pienes had to tear down the scaffolding of the song, had to liberate herself from its safe and suppressing contours to allow through her duende. And how she sang, cried Lorca, her voice, a jet of blood, worthy of her pain. In Korea, of course, pansori, story singing genre with a vocal music production style quite similar to that of kante, is associated with vocal jets of blood. The duende emanating from the scorched throat of the pansori singer is connected to the Korean concept of han, layers of emotional pain that accumulate over time. I know many of you here, maybe all of you here are quite familiar with this trope of Han in Korean traditional arts, um, but bear with me. Kim Il-gu, who may be my favorite living Korean instrumentalist today, explains that the sound of Han in the next video on his boat zither called Ajing. And let me share the video. This is Kim Il-gu, he lives in Chanju and uh, works with uh, my teacher quite often. most scorched throat in Korea today belongs to the pansori singer Pei Il-dong, who spent seven years challenging a waterfall on Mount Jiri A 
few years ago, while driving together one night to Taejeon from Seoul after a concert we had both attended, I got into a discussion with Bae's friend and regular drummer Kim Dong Won. Kim was a pro democracy pro-democracy activist who was tortured in South Korean jail in the 1980s to the point his back was almost broken, which is how he got into Kugak in the first place. He had thought a lot about Han. And I asked Kim how he thought the word might be most appropriately translated into English. We both knew the long list of translation attempts in the literature including those from the 8th century Chinese usage, perhaps best represented by Tang Dynasty poet by Juyi's Song of Everlasting Sorrow from 806. <clears throat> For students of Chinese literature, Tang Hengge, on the topics of the events surrounding the death of Lady Yang Guifei, the beloved concubine of the Emperor Shanzong of Tang during the An Shi Rebellion in 755. But Kim and I wanted to come up with an analogy more specific to the Korean context. Borrowing from many cooking terms to describe Korean's musical flavor, we started at kimchi and eventually ended up at the term fermented sorrow. As a good English phrase to describe the layers of festering pain that accumulate over a lifetime, not just those of an individual, but also of a community or of a nation. In modern parlance, perhaps the term historical trauma provides the best English analog. Tonight, I wanted to connect the emotional pain underlying Korean, Korea's traditional aesthetics with the physical pain often involved in playing Korean traditional music through the examples of pansori and my instrument, the kayagam, and tie the suffering inherent in these genres to South Korea's colonial history and make a pitch for sustaining these emotionally and complex traditions in the midst of today's life of scrolling and scrolling and scrolling. In the case of pansori, it is one thing to talk about singing with a scorched and husky voice, and it is quite another to destroy your vocal cords over years to fully express Han. When we read about vocal production before the age of recording, the example of Pak Dong Jin comes to mind, and he passed away in 2003. Um, and I got to meet him often back in, when I first arrived in Korea in 1992. He was very um, creative and very, um, he taught the audience always about these, these topics when he performed. He was the human intangible culture asset for the famous Chinese story, The Song of the Red Cliff, um, and was the first, as far as we know, beginning in the late 1960s to give complete performances of pansori, which are known as wantang, literally, com literally complete singing singing a story from beginning to end and not in parts, which is a more usual, what was more usual up to then and is more practical now when we uh, deal in bites. So as described by University of Liverpool, Professor Om Hae Kyung, Park's 1968 performance of the Song of Hungbu took five hours and the Song of Chunhyang in the following year lasted for eight hours. Then he went on to give the complete Wanchang performance of all the other pieces of the traditional Pansori repertoire. His new piece, his new Pansori piece that he composed, and he also composed the Bible and all sorts of other things. Um, but the piece that he was famous for is called the Admiral, the Tale of Admiral Yi Sun Shin, um, which lasted a record nine hours and 40 minutes. By the mid seventies, this way of performing a whole Pansori story became a standard practice and the and considered the most appropriate way for a singer to become fully accepted as a professional by both other musicians and the general public. Now, I don't know if any of you have ever been to a one tongue performance. I, I spent a lot of time <laughs> avoiding them. But finally, I went to my friend's performance at the National Theater last year, two years ago. It's, it's, it's really a feat of endurance for, for everybody. They go through several drummers when they perform. Um, they switch drummers between each scene. There's a big long intermission between each. So usually it takes, even if you're singing for six hours, the performance takes about um, eight hours to do. And people come and go as they please. And there's special um, seats at the front 
if the pansori lose pansori singer loses the text there's someone that sits there and feeds text to the pansori singer when they lose their lose their place anyway it's a it's a really amazing feat to watch and to sit through as well even if you love pansori and know the story and everything it's it's a long it's a long performance Not only was the length of Pansori performance extended in the 1960s and 70s, but the length of performance, performances of instrumental genres was also expanded. A good example is Shinoi. This is, um, this is actually a quote. So Shinoi, but Shinoi is the music um, performed by descendants of shaman to accompany a shaman's ritual songs and dances in the western, southwestern provinces, not just the southwestern provinces, but um, in the late 19th and early 20th centuries. Um, and it, involved, it evolved eventually into a multi-instrumental staged ensemble version genre that went from um, about 15 minutes during the time of my teacher's father, Yi Yong-hee, who was the guy who sort of invented the stage version of Shinoi. Um, and he was the first and, and only national treasure for, for Shinoi because as soon as he was designated, he moved to Hawaii and was stripped of all his titles and they never assigned another person the uh, title of, for Shinoi. It was too connected to shamanism and too controversial in terms of internal politics in Korea in the music community. So he was, he was um, the treasure for just a few years. Um, but today's performance, the stage performances of Shinoi last an hour or longer. And performances of the solo form of Shinoi, which we can consider, uh, you know, Sanjo, the instrumental virtuosic genre called Sanjo, which we normally translate as scattered modes or scattered melodies, played by Kayagam, have also gone from around 15 minutes or so in the case of my school. Um, now we have 72 minutes for, for, for the school of Sanjo that I play. Uh, I think Hwambyongi Sanjo is, is uh, 74 minutes. You know, everything's over, over one hour now. And um, you know, having spent the last years memorizing this thing, uh, it's, 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 a real, it's a real thing, this very long thing uh, to play and to listen to as well, depending on the performer. So performances of full Sanjo have thus become rare. And for the most part, they're limited into graduation recitals and special, special events that are for connoisseurs or other students and other musicians. These long performances are not only feats of endurance for singers, but also for instrumentalists. When playing the Kayagam, Korea's best known bridge zither, played without pigs, Lorca's scorched throat takes the form upon layer upon layer of blisters that thicken the fingertips to the point that there is, thankfully, a loss of feeling. And they no longer register when trying to cross the border or to unlock your iPhone. A little special extra bonus. <laughs> these are, of course, these are pictures of, of young players and amateurs who tried to, thought they would take a lesson and, and learn the, <laughs> learned how that goes. This is children. Um, So this is a this is an account from from the Jungan Daily. Um, it was a a foreigner's class from two thousand six, and one a foreigner um, described her um, experience of learning to play Sanjo, learning to play Kayagam in at the Kugog Center. She says, "You will get blisters and bleeding. It will be torture." Miss Ohm tells her class. Later, she draws a diagram of a finger on the board. If your blisters are here, you are correct, she says. And if you don't have calluses yet, there will be blood. One lucky student happened to be a guitarist. He was accepted from the torn flesh that two hours of plucking produced, but all ended the pain, all endured the pain for the promise of sitting up on a stage in 12 weeks, playing one of Korea's best known traditional instruments, the Kayagam. Learning a new instrument may be fun, but for Miss Ohm, the pain of adjusting to hers has a real significance for Korean music. Our country, she says, was invaded a lot by countries like Japan and China, where there is lots of war over a long time. Naturally, there is sorrow about that, 
and that's expressed in our music. So this is a common go pain and hegum pain. <laughs> This teacher reminded me of my own teacher's frequent admonition that our Kayagan performances must be free from our own desires and easy for the listener to sit through for an hour or longer in the case of Sanjo, no matter how painful it is for the player. While singing a complete pansori story in one performance may have come about fairly recently, the work that goes into creating a voice for pansori has always involved an arduous and physically painful process. Kangdogun a contemporary of Pak Dong Jin, described in an interview with Korea University professor of early literature, Yu Yong Dae, the process of finding one's voice through practicing alone in the mountains. This is a process called um, Tok Gong. I'll, I'll describe it later in the talk. And healing the voice through what seems to be aged or fermented human feces. I translate this from the Korean uh, liner notes. He says, The Eastern style of pansori, Dong Pyeongje, requires one to spend time on self-study in front of caves or under waterfalls to develop your own vocal sounds coming out from the bottom of your belly and the throat. This is the only way to gain perfection. I've been working on my sound for 54 years, and during that time I've gone for 100 days of self-study periods dozens of times, living like a monk in the mountains all alone. In any case, to create sori or proper sound, you must lose your voice quite often. Then there is no sound you can hear from your throat. On this process, one has to expend, expend a lot of effort. Of those who have a good voice, there are none who haven't experienced losing their voices during the training. Sometimes a crying, ghost, a crying ghost voice comes out. With effort, one's soft tone gets deeper, and thus, when one gains perfection, people begin to hear from afar although one can't hear one's own voice. That's the moment you reach the perfect point. He continues, there's a saying that blood must flow from your throat to produce a good sound. People who say such things are idiots. Flowing blood means your throat is broken. It's not that the blood needs to spew out of your throat. No need to hurt yourself that seriously. When the throat begins to hurt, you have to drink up dongmul, I translated it, but I don't know if I should say it out loud if you're recording this. It releases the heat from your throat. And when that happens, the voice becomes like a wind chime. That's why we drink tungmul juice, brewed in a round of bamboo and drink it to make our throats karang karang, which means the clear and high pitched. Oh, here's the quote. I forgot to switch the slide, sorry. There you go. You can see my translation of Dongwul. <laughs> <clears throat> the Pansori singer Pei Yul Dong has been trying over the past 15 years or so to come up with a more comprehensive framework to use when co contemplating the rawness of Korean sound and its emotional content. Something beyond well, the well-worn discussions centered on Han, which I know that we're all sort of, those of us to do this topic are, are done with although it's still an important topic for sure. So in director Emma Franz's 2008 director uh, documentary, Intangible Asset Number 82, which in Korean is called Tenkyu Masutokim, with a like bad Western accent. <laughs> but the, the, English, the English title is Intangible Asset Number 82. And that, that refers to um, uh, when she was the national treasure number 82-1. Um, Pei's drummer Kim dong Won accompanies Australian jazz drummer Simon Barker on a journey to beat alien Korean shaman Kim Sok Chul. Kim Sok Chul, just, just as an aside, um, was someone who was very active internationally. He's a hereditary shaman. Um, and he's one of the people that got me interested in Korean um, music because he worked with my, I started out in Japanese music, then moved to Chinese music and only came to Korean music um, in my 20s. 
20, I came here when I was 22 years old in 1992. Um, but I was re very much involved in the, in the Koto world, in the avant-garde Koto world. And he was very active playing with Koto players who were really interested in Korean music. Um, so he was involved in the kugak and jazz scene, but also with uh, Japanese traditional instruments. Um, and I actually overstayed my visa once to see their concert at the uh, National Theater, the Eurasian Echoes concerts. Anyway, he was he was very active internationally. He was collaborating with foreign foreign musicians. He was he was into improvising. He was very open to new new things. Um, but by the time that um, Simon Barker comes along on his journey. He's quite old. And so um, Kim Dong-won takes him on a journey to meet him, which is you know, his dream, but he's quite on his deathbed by this point. So it's, it becomes this sort of quest, you know, that, that he's an elusive character or something, but he was not elusive. He, he was very accessible back when, when, I, was, when I was young too. <laughs> so Simon Barker goes on a journey to meet the alien Korean shaman Kim Seok Chul, um, and the film segment titles and narration highlight various terms associated with hereditary and sh hereditary shaman musicians um, encountered along the way, and they're kind of a list of Korean aesthetics, which has sort of got me into this topic because there was one word I didn't know. Um, so the part that shows Pan Sori singer Pei enduring. Dong enduring many wet hours singing over the sound of the waterfall at Mount Jiri to Kim's accompaniment, which Barker says is the most humbling experience he's had as a musician in his life. Um, this is titled the key. Let's take a look at this early part of the film. Just a, just a clip. <laughs> Death, rebirth, death and rebirth. Francis' film and the contribution made by Pei and Kim Dong Won plunged the aesthetic depths of Korean traditional music. Most of the segment titles of the film come from Taoism and are the most, um, for the most part, well known across East Asia. But they are applied 
and sound very different from culture to culture. I think when we're looking at um, you know visual cultures, there's a lot of overlap between Korea, Japan, and China in terms of you know expressing this or that aesthetic. It's not all the same, but I think where you really see a difference um, with the same concepts is when they're applied to sound. And I was trying to find examples of something like tolbangmi. I'll, I'll, I'll talk about it in a second, but in Japan or in in China, and it's it's quite a different. Um, what each what each country centers as a sort of center aesthetic concept is is quite different. So, for example, what is lofty and connected to the sensitivities of the nobility in Japan and China is connected to regular people here in Korea. What is connected to the sage in China is connected to the shaman in Korea. What is connected to Lady Murasaki Shikibu's Heian era noble prince Genji in Japan is connected to pansori singers here in Korea. When I arrived in Seoul in 1992, the now musical director and actress Colleen Park, he was a student of composition at Seoul National University, as well as a pansori student at Pakaldi, passed on what she considered to be a simple way to differentiate the three main countries of East Asia, using an example of how each country might handle a staging of an outdoor concert in the fall. She says, as they prepare the space, the Chinese would sweep all the fallen leaves away to create a uh, cleaned up performance space ready for people. Um, in Japan, they would sweep all the leaves away and strategically place certain leaves in certain places to create a certain wabi sabi style space. Koreans would just leave everything as it was and hold a concert in, the, in nature. This is her anecdote that she told me. I followed up on it, uh, but there's no need to expand on it here. Um, much might be written on this anecdote, but I invoke you here to enter into a discussion of another study term that comes up in Francis Bell, which is Choi Bami, which you can see on the slide there. In the movie, Kim Do Wan describes it as raw beauty, as rough as the stone in the mountains, as chaotic as what? As water flowing in a stream. Turbani can be heard in Pansori's husky timbre and rhythms, both reflective of nature cycle, destruction, and resonance. Here's an example of the raw sound on a kite from a mighty Jacob also. <laughs> Okay, so this is Sogong Chal School of Sanjo. Um, so let me go back to to Tolbangmi. <clears throat> so in the film invoking Tolbangmi, Pei points out that in a year there are twelve months, three months of spring, three months of summer, three months of fall, and three months of winter. In a typical Korean rhythm cycle, there are twelve beats consisting of four groups of three. Here you can see this is just a typical most basic rhythm, uh, Korean rhythm pattern, uh, where you have 12 beat rhythm pattern. Um, and each each grouping is is a different season. When you have the, you know, slowest kind of rhythm pattern called Jin Yang Jo, it gets very, very long. It's so long that you really have to have different seasons. But this is a shorter, but still having these seasons 12, 12 months in a year, this whole cosmology around rhythm patterns is, is there. Um, I want to, I, I, what I just read was a translation of what he says in the film. So, but he says it in Korean, that's why I wanted to give it to you first. So let's go back and look at uh, this video clip of Tolbangmi. So what he's saying is three months of spring, three months of summer, three months of fall, three months of winter, um, 
12 beads consisting of four groups of three. This is part of what his definition of what the tolbangmi means. So the peril sheds light on the lack of artifice in the Korean aesthetic and ties directly into the necessary destruction and rebuilding of the concert of these singers' vocal cords to obtain pure sound. It flashes a sign in his book called Doko. The word I mentioned about with the uh, word. <laughs> so this title could be uh, toko. In books, it's a term. Uh, in books, it's a term that in Korean music circles among punsori singers in particular, um, and su suggests the seclusion of oneself in the mountains, away from the corrupting dust of society, and challenging waterfalls to singing contests which is mentioned earlier, debated for seven years in Jisang, much as Kamdogun had done beforehand. Although in this case, perhaps without the special juice. They continued to explore Pansori's inner sources in his forthcoming book, actually it just came out, in his book that just came out, <laughs> um, called Tugum. Tugum, Tugum means to obtain and Tugum means Sound or, or voice, a mm -hmm. sound to the um, deep in Chinese. <laughs> so, this is a term referencing perfected vocal ability attained, obtained by masters only after decades of work. The process of toko produces to them. Um, and in his third chapter, he captioned like this. Which means unskilled skill. <laughs> and this brought from also the 6th century BC the Dao De Jing, or To Tokyo, okay? In its search for the roots of the word to the phrase Te Gyo Ya Jol, Dai Chao um, so when I saw this movie, I was trying to figure out, like, how can I talk about Tulbami to students, because um, everywhere I looked, it was, it was all very complicated and related to uh, literary theory and all this stuff. And since I have to teach in Korean, um, the students were up to the end and there was I, so I was looking, you know, looking for the roots of this idea of uh, Tulbami, which is an unusual word, I think. I don't think most Koreans use it in normal life. And, and, uh, when I talk to my teachers about, you know, have you used this word? You know, no, no, it's all pedo <laughs> and you know, really uh, have pulled it, pulled it out and applied it to um, to Korean traditional music in recent years. But I think it, I think it fits nicely um, when we look at what it means. So this this phrase, take uh, you Translates approximately to great skill may appear inelegant or coarse. James 
like he's James Isaac, isn't it? Like, like he, nigga. Um, classical translation of this giant passage in the Tao Te Ching reads like this. This is a very old translation, but it's amazingly um, worded. It rhymes. So, who thinks his great achievements poor shall find his vigor long endure? A greatest fullness deemed of void, exhaustion never shall stem the tide. Do thou what straight so crooked deem thy greatest art still stupid seem? Seem and eloquence a stammering scream. There are many translations of this, but I put this one just because it's amazing. So, um, before I move on to the next part of the lecture, I just wanted to look at uh, visual representations of, um, you know, this idea of of. Uh, Tegyo Yaktol, Tegyo Yaktol, or Tulbangmi. So, usually when we think about it, um, we think of ceramics, especially, um, we actually think of, you know, the whole uh, Imjin Weiran, you know, 16th century. Hideyoshi came, came from Japan and uh, kidnapped a bunch of uh, potters from this area where I live now in Keryongsan and took them back to, to Japan so that they could make this whole tado for Hideyoshi. So, but so a lot of Japan's ideas about you know wabi sabi are very much influenced by this this idea from from Lao Tzu. So usually we're thinking of pottery initially when we use this term, well, not music so much. Um, just 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 uh, stone statues, uh, Korean Buddhist um, countryside, you know, uh, There's a roughness to the Korean examples, you know, not fully filled out like Chinese and Japanese examples. Also the, you know, the um, guardian generals. Shaman art as well is, is I remember um, at Wesleyan University, I had, I was there for a concert and they were simultaneously having a exhibit of shamanic art in the, in the Freeman gallery. And all the Chinese scholars and Japanese scholars were like, what is this? This is an art. What is this? How can we? They didn't have a way to talk about it. And the curators didn't either. Um, so everybody was just kind of disappointed in, the, in what they were seeing. And um, nobody had a way to discuss it. Korean architecture as well. If we look at, I and mean, if we think about what, you know, when, when people talk about Taoism, they talk about water flowing uh, from the mountain to the sea without, without thinking with the, with the uh, wu wei, right? There's a wu wei. And that the water flows in whatever shape it's been given. So this, this idea of, you know, I can't use my cursor now. Um, you know, whatever the shape wood, the wood is in, you can put it there and then fill it with the thing that flows. This is a magazine, an aesthetics magazine from 2018. Calligraphy. Calligraphy was my other passion besides music. Um, on the bottom of this slide, you can see an example of very sort of um, correct and, uh, you know, perfect hangul. And on the top, you see the example of the tolbangmi style. And this really struck me when I first came to Korea as well from a background in Japanese and Chinese studies. You know, also with the background in calligraphy, I was a calligraphy major at the Nanjing Academy of Arts. So looking at these kind of fonts that Koreans like to use on um, signs and also even on computers, I couldn't figure out why, why, why they would choose these fonts. Like what, if you had a choice between this one and that font, why would you choose this Chodokumi style? Uh, it's, it's, it's taken me a while. Also, when I first arrived and started playing the kayak, I couldn't understand the, the sound. It seemed very dark and not, not beautiful in the Chinese The perfect angelic sound of the metal strings with, you know, perfect hand gestures and perfect, you know, moving your body in the perfect way to express the music. This is all thrown out of the window in Korea. And it took me some time to 
appreciate and then to sort of, um, you know, think about philosophically. This is famous on the top, you see that um, uh, Taya, famous quote from the from Confucius, from the, from the no, no, from the uh, Analex. Check out this drum. This is a um, Poko. It's a Buddhist drum. Usually you think the drum is going to be you know, nice and round, and this is a Korean uh, Poko. Just, you know, that's the shape of the lock. So put some skin on it and you have the drum. There's no reason to make it into the perfect shape. Pop the reflect. In a sandwich, I just pulled pull this off the internet. <clears throat> This is really, I had really trouble understanding this when I first came to Korea. Why would you choose this font? <laughs> Why don't fit this together? So, um, <clears throat> now I want to talk a little bit about um, the colonial period. Um, so, Korean director Ying Guan Kek is from genealogy, adapted from a short story by Katiyama Toshiki, appoints his main character Tani, based on Japanese scholar Yanagi Sosetsu, who is also known in Korea as Yanagi Miyoshi, who lived from 1889 to a high class and often patrol list to Korea file of the colonial period. He's appointed in the in Tokpo, the movie, as the spiritual arbiter between the colonizer and the colonized. In the story, the Korean protagonist facing the prospect of being forced to take Japanese names under the policy Naisen Ittai, or Japan and Korea One Body, <clears throat> turns to ceramics, but not rustic tea bowls, mind you, but high class blue celadon vases, you know, young man class which he sees as embodying his people's sorrow and longing. Let's take a little look at a clip from this film, uh, Chokpo. ねえ、ディディ。ちゃんくらけ<笑><笑><笑><笑><笑><笑><笑> Yanagi Muneo Shiranen, Ilbon Sara Mekuri Sengang Nanungun. Nugudun Choson Sara Ilgul De, Kuoduku Pi Chaman, Teronun Kung Pani.
손이다. 그들이 표출한 손이야말로 그들 민족의 말할 수 없는 온갖 원한이나 슬픔이나 명가 있는 것이다. 이렇게도 비에 찬 미가 이 세상에 어디에 또 있을까? 이 손에 비사를 풀지 못하면 조선의 마음에 들어갈 수 없다. 조선은 비록 밖으로는 약하더라도 그 예술에 있어서 안으로는 강한 나라다. 야나기 문의 오시는 이렇게. 
Okay, that's enough. Um, it's a long video. You can watch the whole thing if you want. Just uh, PM me. Um, and I had a whole long section on this video and what's going on in America today, but I'm just um, going to skip to the end now. So in a way, this goes to show that history, history can be just as easily erased through distraction as suppression. The American cultural anthropologist Renato Ros Rosalda points out that nostalgia often involves a mourning for the passing of traditions that we ourselves have intentionally and too often inadvertently tra have transformed. And he notes, we valorize innovation and then yearn for more stable worlds, whether these reside in our own past, in other cultures, or in the conflation of the two. When people are not able to adapt quickly enough to change, when progress is not properly managed, excessive loss may lead to excessive longing and a desire to assuage it by endowing traditional art objects and forms, indeed the past itself, with qualities of perfection, fueling fantasies of national exceptionalism and long expired dreams of prosperity through isolationism. As the Australian rocker Nick Cave has said, melancholy hates haste and floats in silence. It must be handled with care. The fact that most every culture has a word for duende speaks to the intrinsic place of suffering in all human existence. But because the way suffering may manifest in music and other arts depends on endless cultural variables. Dende's and Han's future role as an aesthetic driver remains uncertain. Like the bleeding throat and blistered fingers and the bullet bruised body and burning eyes, it must be handled with care. Thank you very much. Jocelyn, thank you very interesting and informative. We appreciate your sharing with us tonight. Actually, um, I have two more videos if you want to hear them. It's, it's a North Korean piece of music then played by, by South Korean kids. It's very popular on both sides. So we can hear it if you want. Otherwise, we can take questions and listen to it later. Okay, let me, let me before we move on, I think, I think many of us would enjoy hearing that. Uh, one of our listeners wrote me a message asking if we can, where, where she could find the film Chokpo, genealogy, uh, the clip you played with the children asking grandfather for Japanese names. Where, where could one find that movie? Uh, <laughs> the internet, <clears throat> the, uh, the library, the, uh, you have to, I found the clip on the internet um, and I can send the link uh, to the person I can send it to you and you can send it to the person. Okay. Yeah, Professor, uh, could you send it to me? That's my question, Kate. Okay. Kate Emerald is the questioner. You could send it to her. Mm -hmm. uh, <clears throat> I, I, I've got several people saying, yes, please, let's, let's see these other clips that you have. Uh, okay. So, so let's do it. <laughs> let's right. So, I mean, I had given a paper about the merging aesthetics of North and South Korea, which is not the topic of this paper, but I, I sort of left this in. This is a piece called Trugang, um, which translates to still coming out. Um, and Kim Yong-sil uh, was inspired to write Trugang um, when he was working at a steel mill in North Korea. And so this was a very, it's based on a very popular Korean um, North Korean folk song, and this became a really big hit in South Korea. Um, so, so this you could hear on the on the radio station all the time a few years back. So this is the North Korean version for Kayagum. Let's take a listen. Called Trugang.
So you can see the North Korean instrument has 20 strings, I think, um, and it's not tuned pentatonically. So it's a, it's a really, it's got plastic strings, some steel strings, very different instrument than we have in the South, very tight strings, very big distances for your hand to cover. Um, and the gestures that they make when they play is very close to Chinese style um, Zheng performance practice in terms of um, gesturing. Okay, this is the North Korean version and now we'll listen to the um, students of the uh, South Korean uh, Kugak High School playing the same. This became a famous um, piece for Komungo, which is an, an uh, along with Kemyeonjo, the sad mode in the north, the, the, the Komungo also disappeared as an instrument because it was associated with the Yangban class. So it was too uh, snotty an instrument to be, um, to be uh, imported in the north. So um, it's a little bit ironic that this North Korean folk tune came to the south with the, on the Komungo. Okay. Wow, great. Thank you again. Uh, unfortunately, you can't hear all of us clapping at the same time, but I think we all would do that. Um, if you have any questions, now's the time to do that. I can turn off, I can turn off, yeah. That's we got it. Yep. So now my screen's off, right? Yeah. You're, yeah, we're, we're just seeing you now. All right, now I can look at everybody. Ooh, look at that. Are there any questions? I have a question. Go ahead. Hey. Um, uh, okay, so this is going to be related to BTS, obviously. I'm going to write BTS, yeah. <laughs> so what's the name of the uh, recent video they just dropped? Dechita? Dechita. Dechita. So you want to have my lecture on that? I gave a lecture on that just today, an hour before this lecture. <laughs> oh, well, we're all prepared for this question. That, um, so this, it occurred to me, okay, if they're going to be appropriating movie, you know, pulling in aspects of a uh, hardcore traditional culture to their, you know, K-pop sounds, like mm -hmm. to what extent did they, do you see them um, pulling in also the part of the traditional uh, what the kids would call the traditional music flex, which to to some extent is the uh, is the blistering, is the blood in the throat. Um, you know, you, you worked hard, you sacrificed for this Han that helps make you talented and worth worth listening to. So, what to ex some extent the uh, young kids would call a flex. To what extent is this traditional kind of flex brought into the things that they're importing into their K-pop? Is yeah, this is a this is a good question. Um, let me just so everybody does everybody know what we're talking about. Yes. 
Yeah. <laughs> so, um, can you share my screen again, or do I have to do that? You'll have to do it. I have to do it? You have to, yep. Okay, I'm gonna share my screen, because I just gave a lecture on this a few hours ago. So I have my <laughs> PPT ready <laughs> for you. Um, Okay, this is, this is that, and let me just give you a taste of the traditional, of the, of the um, traditional version. Um, so to answer your question, you can see what what um, the August D used is a clip that's directly from the original Che Chita. What he used in his clip is the same. In fact, it might even be these guys that, that are you know performing Te Chita. I mean, Te Chita, Chita is a marching music. So this is the kind of music that was used to announce the king is coming. You can if you go to Insadong or you go up in front of the um, Gyeongbokgung, you can see these guys in yellow. They always wear yellow for Te Chita. Um, and they, they go and clear the streets so that, you know, all the people get to the side of the road and, um, you know, get ready for, re to respect the king who's coming down the, down the street. Um, so in this video, I think that he's also sort of referencing uh, Sado Seiji, doesn't he? The, the, the rice, the rice check, the rice chest. Uh... <laughs> anyway, it's a kind of a bloody, bloody video. It ends with, um, you know, it, it has a beheading and a, and an almost beheading and a murder in it. Um, you saw also in the video that I shared the the um, the last the the, the uh, electronic. Um, Group with the Waikiki Kiki. It was also quite a militaristic uh, <laughs> video with guns and, and such. Um, another video that I um, talked about today for students is the um, is the the Chinese um, member of what is it EXO that came out with a new video um, in China with him as uh, the um, general um, Xiang Yu. The Hangu in Korean, Hangu Hangu Taegun. It's also a very, um, you know, this sort of fantasy of a, a very virile young man, you know, becoming kind of king or the conquering general. Um, of course, Hangu Hangu in the story, um, you know, loses to uh, to uh, his rival, and he, does, he doesn't get to um, found the Han Dynasty. But you know, he's he's a very tough guy, and there's all sorts of stories and songs about him picking opera, and also Korean, um, you know, the um, kasa and kago, all different genres talk about the same same guy. So um, 
it's interesting that it, this is not the beginning of you know using fugak in 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 pop music. We can find examples going back. Um, I think the you know the, when we talk about the beginning of K-pop, we're probably talking about you know sote sote DM boys, mm -hmm. and um, you can go go back and look through their stuff. They use a lot of tepyongso. In fact, all of these guys like to use tepyongso. That's the main instrument in techita. So we can find in the sote DM boys the the tepyongso usage. We also find in um, some other, um, uh, I think um, Sai also uses Taepyeongso in some of his work. Um, we can find also in, um, what's his name? Yukaksu. Yukaksu has a pansori, like, um, you know, Hungbu. Hungbu ga Giga uh, Makyo, this, this song that he has. So there's, there's lots of examples, but I think when you, when they're using this, this Taepyeongso, uh, um, it's often, making themselves into kings in some way. It's kind of either a king or like, um, you know, this uh, it, it brings two ideas out. One is the, the king and the other idea would be the, the sort of countryside, you know, one of the folks, farmer music kind of festival kind of fun. Uh, idea. I think those are the two main things that are sampled in, in uh, pop music, but I'm not a pop music specialist by any means. So you have to ask a cedar bowl. Jocelyn, there, someone's uh, done a, uh, sent in a question or a comment. Uh, my first language is Portuguese. Ah, I, I said it wrong, agree. I'm sorry. <laughs> I do not agree that duende is equivalent to saudade. None of them are equivalent. None of them are exactly the same. They're all, you know, they're not all the same. They're not the same as Han either. They all have their own cultural references, their own histories, their own baggages, their own um, styles that go with them. So I'm not trying to say that they're the same, but I'm saying that all these countries have something that deals with this sort of emotion of, um, you know, some kind of depth, depth and um, pain that goes with the music or something that you're trying to express that um, that's not the normal kind of expression. <laughs> but I, I, I don't even, I don't even know that much about Portuguese. I'm just, I'm just reading things and coming up with poetic ideas, but I don't, I don't, I don't mean to make that um, claim. I've got a question. Uh, just a moment. Uh, John logged in with a, comment about Ibaksa. What, what, uh, John, can you? I can probably see these chat things, huh? Yeah. Ibaksa? Oh, Ibaksu. You said Ibaksu. Did you mean Ibaksa? No, I meant Yukaksu. <laughs> okay. You know, the oh. Hungbuga Kiga Mankyo, Kumbuga, Kiga Mankyo, that song that's taken off of the Humbuga. Okay, uh, someone else said they had a question. Who was that? Yeah, this is me, Kate. Oh, Kate, okay, go ahead. So, what is your perspective um, of grief holding on to Han in South Korea? Can you hear me? Yeah, yeah. Grief, what, you said. Yeah, grief, Han, what is the role, functionality of holding on to that as a nation? In, in spite of trauma, when psychologically grief can be transformed in order to evolve as a humanity. Yeah, I mean, I think this is inherent in the idea of Han that you have to, um, you know, you, you have to overcome. This is why, why we use the, we tried to use this idea of fermented sorrow that, you know, it gets tastier as it ferments. <laughs> and it, you, you that, that, that there's a, um, sublimation and that that you know fully realized han is not not sobbing crying bleeding but it's you know being being stronger because of it right do you think so yeah. i mean there's han is a, is a fraud term i know i know that it's a fraud term and there's all sorts of death definitions out there and different ways to understand it and you can understand it through dance through salpuri um throwing down the scarf and um, picking it back up again there's, there's different ways to understand it. And I think that, um, you know, depending on how old you are, depending on when, where you're situated in history, you're going to understand it differently because it's, 
it's something that's hard to understand as, as something on a paper, as a textual thing. It's a, something that, that you experience, right? And then you experience it over time, as, especially as you get older. But, but everybody experiences in their own way, in a way. But I also said it's, it's a national um, collective kind of um, uh, term. Um, and I said it was, I talked about, um, what did I say? I said about the um, historical trauma, right? And that, that's inherited from, from um, generation to generation in a way. Um, and I think that has to do with memory and keeping memory alive. And then also what we do in, in playing this music is also kind of remembering and keeping that alive. But it always, it always gets reinvented when you, when I play Kayagam, what, what, what does that mean as a foreigner? I've been, I've been playing for almost 30 years now, but I've been playing with, uh, you know, with, with serious teachers and I've been playing seriously, but what is, what does that mean when I play it as opposed to when a Korean plays it, as opposed to um, when a young person just starts playing it or when they make the, you know, pop, pop music videos, it, all those things have different meanings. Um, so I, I, I can't say I'm an expert on, on Han. I just, what, I, what I'm thinking about it is what I presented tonight. Um, but I'm sure all of you have your own idea of what Han is. Um, a question on the chat. Oh no, uh, it was already taken care of. Oh, was it taken care of? Oh, okay, yeah, all right. Okay. I just didn't hear the answer. Okay, thank um, you, yeah. Um, but I do have a question. Um, um, so there is the Samnuri master uh, Kim Dok Su, mm. and he was actually the one who played the Te Pyong, uh, De Pyong So in the Sateji um, song, the famous one, Horara or something like that. Mm. Or, uh, anyway, um, uh, so anyway, he said that to continue growing traditional music, it kind of has to merge with modern pop music. So just in your opinion, I was just wondering what you, where do you think the line is between having traditional music and having pop music? I, I'm a big fan of, of, um, of Kim Dok Su and I agree with him mostly, almost all the time. <laughs> and um, I'm very, I, re I really like his work, especially the work that he did with Red, Red Sun Samunori. Um, he's not really, I don't find what he's doing is merging with pop. He's, he's very much in the sort of new music avant-garde, but in the, um, you know, he's, he's doing a lot of work with jazz more than pop, I think. So, you know, when, when he says it has to merge with pop, okay, that's one way, you know, when, when the train gets going from the station, which is the Hallyu train, which is the K-pop train, then if you want to survive, you kind of need to hitch, hitch your wagon to it if you want to keep going, right? So everybody's kind of doing that. And plus, you know, musicians need to survive. They're not, most of them are not academics. They're actually performers that are, you know, surviving in a world that's rapidly changing sonically. And um, so I'm all for that. Um, what I don't like is frivolous, um, unthoughtful <laughs> moving forward. But I think there's so many projects right now that are, that are you know, what people call fusion. I think it's not quite the right term, but um, making, you know, growing something from from the roots to create something new which i think is very exciting there's so many exciting projects right now that really create a new sound for kubak um, every group has their own project going on really really wonderful projects i'm really excited about what i'm not very excited about is playing vivaldi on the kayagum or you know this kind of <laughs> um and i'm not excited about playing pop music on the kayagum you know just taking the latest song and then putting it up although this is good for tiktok and that kind of thing it, it's amusing for a second, but it's not, it doesn't move anybody. It doesn't move a thing forward. It just, you know, it's a, it's a scrolling item. Um, but some of the other projects are definitely not scrolling items. Um, one of my favorite groups is the Tonga, Tonga Akwe, which is, um, you know, it comes out of the um, aristocratic vocal music tradition, but they're doing all sorts of collaborations with um with uh, flamenco and, and and jazz and um, you know just all sorts of different things, all sorts of collaborations. There's a lot of new pansori music being written. Um, there's a there's a there's a, there was a for a few years there was a lot of work with the German fairy tales, writing new pansori for German fa fairy tales. Um, there's 
there's a uh, custom change change customs are changing with regard to kugak so that people don't get so stuck in um you know the image that the image of kugak doesn't get so stuck in the past and it can be more interesting to younger uh, listeners and viewers um but i think there's if you want to move forward you have to keep the old traditional life because if you lose the old tradition then then you lose um what's the foundation for growing something new so everybody needs to be sort of trained, I think, in Sanjo and is the, have a traditional foundation in order to move everything forward in a new way. Anybody else? Uh, <laughs> yeah, yeah, I just, I'm just kind of wondering though then, so if they've been trained classically in the, you know, the, the way that they're supposed to be trained, then, and it's not frivolous, then it's everything is okay, you think? Like everything's fair game? I think everything's fair game. Definitely, you can go hip hop, you can do everything, but you need to have that foundation. Otherwise, you lose the Koreanness of it. Without that, then it just becomes a board with strings, and then it can be a koto or a kayagam or a gojang. It doesn't even matter. It's just a board with strings. So you you lose all the sort of things that the aesthetics that are come with the instrument and all the meaning that comes with that. If you don't have any, if you don't have like basic training, then you're not going to be able to. Um, I've seen a lot of Korean American projects that with that doesn't have that training, um, but that becomes a different thing. That becomes a, a Korean American project and not really a Korean um, rooted. It's rooted in Korean identity, but not rooted in Korean um, aesthetics necessarily. Or even when it is, you know, where there's a thought to it, but there's not the training that goes with it. So it becomes a different kind of um, sound and project, which is which is its own thing and can also be good when it's done well. Thank you. Thank Daniel, you. Uh, did you have a question? <laughs> all right. Um, first of all, thanks for the lecture. I enjoyed it a lot. I will take some time to get the picture of the Dungmul out of my mind, but that's OK. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. Uh, uh, as, we, as we were talking about um, music, I thought, OK, um, maybe we can also talk about uh, compared with architecture. So with, with what? Traditional architecture, uh, I would architecture. say Nowadays, so many people in power positions are concerned with what traditional architecture is supposed to be. So mm -hmm. we have this bunch of guidelines we have to follow now. If you want to get subsidies, it must be this, it must be that. Then it's just by a comedy. And so we get a result. Um, I, I can't see the Tulbagmi anywhere that we used mm -hmm. to have in the United States, but we get a sort of I would say a uh, shallow echo or shadow of what traditional architecture used to be, like a car caricature almost, sort of. Mm -hmm. um, and I would be interested in uh, what the situation is with contemporary traditional music. Do you see the Chulbagmi? Is it still there? Because in architecture, some, some, sometimes people think, oh, this is the Chulbagmi, and I think mm, it's Tubake. It's <laughs> You know what I'm trying to say? Yes. It's, what is it in traditional? Contemporary music. So I mean, you you mean like new music composed by a German composer or something like this? It's both maybe uh, newly composed traditional music, but also mm -hmm. the performances of the old pieces. Yeah, um, these are two different things. Um, as far as new music goes, I think new music is new music, and that often when you're working with composers. Um, especially foreign composers, but also Korean composers. I mean, this sort of um, appropriation of people who don't really know anything about Korean music happens domestically just as well as it does internationally. Um, so working with composers, are they're much more interested in their own ideas about... Um, <laughs> own ideas about... Um, you know what what they're trying to build and they try to, often they try to understand something about korea but they don't have a very deep background in it so so then it's up to the player to bring that taste and flavor to the piece even if it's a completely contemporary new piece um this is different than architecture a little bit because the architect well maybe it, it's not like you write the design and then somebody else goes and interprets your design and then builds it right you're, you're involved in the process of of course the composer is involved in working with you as a player but um, often there's because composers don't really know about creative music the player's pretty free to add those things but when you're in a like very contemporary new music kind of situation which is 
I'm not talking about what Kim Dok Soo does, which is um, much more improvisational and um, mixing with the, um, especially jazz. He does a lot of work with jazz. But I'm really talking about like contemporary avant-garde new music from like, um, you know, most of the composers in, in Korea are trained in Germany and then America is the secondary country. So either they're in the German school or the um, American school. And yeah, as I said, it's up to the player to bring those aesthetics to the piece to make it sound Korean in some way. As far as um, what you were talking about with um, the second one was what, what about the, um, the um, performances of old pieces. Yeah, performance of old pieces. So this is a, I have to say this is, there's a lot of stuff to be really excited about. Um, in terms of what young people are doing. And then there's th there's not a lot of the old teachers left anymore. Mm -hmm. So, um, and uh, they're, still, they're still around and we're all studying, studying very hard with them. And I, I could just speak from my own experience um, with that, is that it takes a long time to, to start to understand. Um, I've been playing 30 years now and like only in the last five years, I started like, Every year I keep playing, playing, playing. And then like suddenly I understand something. And then I like, how come I never, under my teacher said the same thing for 30 years, but then finally it went into my head. And then we can see it with the younger players too. As you, as you go on, it takes a long time to understand the minutia of, of what those things are and what they mean. Uh, what I want to say is that it takes, takes a really long time to understand physically. My teacher always told me, like, don't try to understand with your head. You keep trying to understand with your head. You have to understand with your body. You have to just practice, practice, practice it. You have to come into your body. You can't understand it without the physical part of your body understanding it. So um, that takes a really long time. And to get that, you need to be <laughs> abused by your teacher. And um, it's really hard to be a student. And I think um, a lot of people won't put up with it today. So there, and you also get a lot of project managers that don't know you know, even if the architect knows, right, then the project manager and all the people down at the level on the project don't don't necessarily know. So you have the same problem in music. Jocelyn, thank you. Our time's come to a close. We appreciate your participation and the questions. We've had an enjoyable evening, I think. Um, a reminder, uh, volume 94, the current issue of Transactions, the, our journal has been printed and is available. If you are a member uh, and live in Korea, you can call the office or drop by the office to pick one up, or we can mail it to you. If you are not in Korea, uh, we can't mail it to you until the post office frees up uh, international postal services, but contact us at the office and we can, at, in, the begin, at, in the interim at least, give members a PDF version of that. Uh, if you're not a member, we can sell you a copy, but you'll have to ask Joanne how much. Um, I don't know the price for that. Well, if you're not a member, just join up and then you can get it for free. That's the thing to do. Uh, two weeks from tonight, uh, Cedar Bao Seji will be with us and she's going to talk about K-pop and the, the side businesses and things that have sprung up from that uh, K-pop thing. That should be rather interesting. So we hope you'll join us then. Again, thanks for being with us. Uh, Jocelyn, thanks so much for your hard work for the lecture tonight. It was very interesting. Everybody's clapping, you can see. Uh, I'll bid you good night.